everyone online um, watching later and, and in person live. Uh, this is week nine of our packages book club with R for DS. Um, we are getting into the new section on uh, metadata. Um, and we have Stas presenting chapter nine. Right. So you supposed to be seeing the first slide that says description file, right? Yep. Looks good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So description file is what basically makes makes it a package. So every package has a description. Anything with description is a package. Um, that's, as Sterling said, that's the core element of metadata. Um, uh, well, metadata is data about data or uh, data about something, uh, about an object. So um, following through with the use this stuff, uh, create package, uh, among other stuff, uh, creates this description file. It does a little bit more. It um, um, creates other pieces of backbone infrastructure like our build ignore and whatnot, but that's the main component. So it's in the uh, name value pair format. So values may be long over several lines and names are typically in proper capitalization. And, and basically every section has a corresponding uh, disk library function that reads it or writes it or manipulates it. So this is this is the baby description file that's created by this use package example. Um, and basically it nudges you to, well, follow along and uh, modify this um, to fit what you, uh, what your package is supposed to be doing. So there's the package name, the title, uh, version, author's description, uh, licensing, uh, and some other technical information. So we'll go over this by, by one by one. So a title is a single line a description of the package. Um, it's supposed to be about 50, 65 characters. And um, I've seen uh, that in some workflows of, of the packages, this gets truncated anyway. So you better stick to that convention. Um, it's, well, it's a one line description of the package in, in kind of passive nominal voice. Um, it's suggested that you do not include the package name uh, because it's it's going to be, what's it, Malkin Malkin, uh, the guy who was in the um, Home Alone, he changed his name <laughs> to double, triple. Um, if you need to put any anything like other R packages, like this package enhances ggplot. So ggplot is supposed to go in uh, in those quotes. Description uh, is somewhat longer sentence. So uh, in this example, so we see title uh, is this what the package does, one line title case, and description is they intentionally kind of spread this over several lines, and the subsequent lines are indented by four spaces. That's a standard conver convention. Like if you're lighting markdown, that's, you know, know that this is a continuation. Uh, again, expect to use single quotes. Um, and that's, that's something that's... Um, for instance, this this is what ggplot title and description is. Create elegant data visualizations using the grammar of graphics. This is a system for declaratively creating graphics based on the grammar of graphics book. You provide the data, tell ggplot how to map variables to aesthetics, what graphical primitives to use, and it takes care of the details. So the way it looks, uh, let me see if I can blow this up a little bit. So this is going to be the listing on CRAN. So this is, this is going to be your title in the list of packages. And when you click on the uh, on that on that package, you're going to see title repeated, and you're going to see this description at the very top. Uh, supposedly not not too long, not too boring. Um, next element 
all in this example description file was version. This is version 0009000. 000, so this is this is a very clear message that this this is a baby version. Um, the package numbering goes in the form of major dot minor dot patch. Um, some packages go along with major dot minor dot patch dot development. Um, the semantic versioning. Uh, there's a full details, more details on the on this semver uh, .org website. So basically, the going back from from the outward number patch patch means you you're you're working on some bug fixes, um, and you're not doing much in terms of uh, actual functionality. I think if you're doing like adding tests, that also would qualify as a patch. Um, minor version when you add functionality in the backward compatible manner that you wrote a new function it has uh, some functionality that's a minor version you edit inputs to an existing function uh, now it supports some sort of extra output or whatever it you know, deals with a specific way of missing values um, that's it that's a new input that's a backward compatible manner um, that's a minor version. Major version is when things really, really change in um, how you operate. That's that's how you see packages go into version 0 0.17.5. Um, um, so dev is, is, has a specific meaning for some uh, of the workflow processing um, software like uh, I think GitHub has specific way of dealing with dev versions. Uh, I'm not exactly fully sure. So Bioconductor has its uh, its own uh, supplementary rules along with that. Um, and they have to do with even an odd schedule. Um, so uh development is supposed to have an odd number and release is supposed to have an even number so that's that's kind of internal indication of how things are supposed to happen so you work on 1.1 but you release 1.2 uh, so there is a specific description of uh how that is supposed to work and i think that's probably a very reasonable um set of conventions uh this this the our packages book doesn't go into that. I just dug this out and edit here. So package version is the functionality to uh, compare different packages, and we're gonna see that this is what's gonna be used in imports and requirements, and that forms the basis of dependency checking. So there's gonna be more on uh, package lifecycle. I think that's chapter twenty one, um, and. Uh, um, versioning needs to be done. So not with every commit, but with basically, I think that on every merge to master, you definitely have to increase the version somehow so that um, things that did change are properly propagated. So uh, authors, so every CRM package, well, every R package supposed to have an indication who you need to report bugs to, and that's the maintainer. Um, and this is preferred. The preferred way these days is authors at R, uh, although historically you could also write author and maintainer. The package had to have a maintainer as a required field. So um, authors at R uh execute our function given name family name middle name email um, role um so the roles are cre current maintainer aut authors who made significant contributions contributor um founder copyright holder so uh you can this this i don't think this is kedley wickham's orchid but you you can put orchid um to keep track of this of your package as a um, contribution. I don't 
I says I I hope that CRN reports this this kind of stuff to work it. I haven't put my my packages on CRN or on GitHub. I don't know how that gets passed. If somebody else has experience in with this, uh, please share. So once again, this is the preferred way of specifying um, the authorship of the package in contributions using authors that are. Um, and comment is an open field. So multiple authors can be just concatenated to one another. So in this case, they're saying that this package, uh, the current maintainer is, is Hadley Wickham. Another important author is uh, uh, Winston Chang. And R Studio is the copyright holder for that package. So that would probably have to be some sort of something like R Studio Connect or something like that. Uh, RSC Connect. Uh, RS Connect, what am I talking about? Something like that uh, would have a structure like this. So, uh, so some other fields. So in this Git description file, I don't think we have those, but uh, some other fields that could be in description file are URL and bug reports. So URLs would be uh, places where the package would be found. So typically uh, these days, this would be the uh, GitHub repo where the development happens and the reference to the compiled uh, book down, package down site. So bug reports would be the email address of the maintainer repeating the information in authors that are, or the GitHub issues page I've seen I've seen both. I think well, GitHub issues is obviously more useful. Um, so use GitHub and use GitHub links. We'll automatically generate those, uh, so that you don't have to worry terribly much. So licensing uh, is going to be a separate chapter. Uh, there are different flavors of open source licenses, and I frankly have no clue about those. Uh, all of the packages that I develop internally with the company, they are licensed to the company. So this was so well. I don't have any any ownership of that stuff uh, for what it's worth. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to share your package, you need to figure out how you're going to allow other people use it. What the applications would be, what the um, how is this supposed to, uh, your code supposed to be reusable and how your code is supposed to be modifiable. That's the essence of open source is that uh, you should provide a way to uh, modify your packages. So next important section is imports uh, and suggests. So this is where the dependencies are declared. Uh, again, there's a whole chapter on that. I, I think that's next chapter, uh, chapter 10. No. So imports is, well, something along the lines of you've been using dplyr or mutate in your code. You have to declare dependency on dplyr. You're using ggplot to, uh, to plot some, some of the results. You're supposed to declare that dependency. If you're using tidy select uh, verbs as a standalone verbs, that's you can import the player or you can say, well, I just need to, to, to have those study select as the original source, which is a little better than going through inputs and re-importing things. I've seen some longish threads of things, for instance, imported from Haven by labeled, then SG labeled, and that's saying, well, <laughs> you probably want to have things imported properly. So uh, what import does is it says this is this stuff is required from the functionality of your code. Uh, it, this will be installed or updated when users install your package. So um, that's the uh, list of dependencies you see. Also installing blah uh, when this is uh, when when a package is being installed. So the dependency checking happens in the sense that when you library something uh you might see failures if um something one typical the typical ones that i see this our lang 1.0.7 is required but 1.05 is already loaded and can be uh, cannot be unloaded because there's so much stuff depends on it 
So and then okay, well, you have to start trickery is figure out what how you unload namespace or load the packages in the order uh, that they have a different dependencies on and uh, kind of figure out, okay, well, then you start going into description in the libraries uh, of the packages in the description files, capital description file in that whatever you've loaded, janitor, deplier, and see this one relies on our length 1.05, this one relies on 1.07. So you need to make sure that you first load the one that depends on 107 so that the one that requires 105 does not complain. So uh, that kind of information uh, you can find from description files. Uh, I stumbled upon a nice command and a nice functionality to produce the dependency trees, but I forgot where it was, unfortunately. Maybe it's in the desk library. If somebody remembers what that was, maybe drop this into chat if you don't mind. Um, so suggests are the packages that uh, you would use in tests, vignettes, uh, other development tasks, but this would not be present in the body of your of the functions in your code. So if in vignettes you're using uh ggplot2 to, to produce some visualization of what your package does, but this is uh ggplot is not required. You don't use ggplot in your main functions in the inner package then this this goes into into suggests uh, usually this is well much shorter test so my experience is that i think um dev tools check starts complaining when you have 15 dependencies as inputs this says well your package is probably fragile um in the sense that it depends on too much crap and uh given the things change on CRAN, probably something's going to be broken very soon um that's that's again that's uh, style suggestion. Let's put it this way. Um, so uh, you typically don't bother putting stuff into description by hand, uh, and for the package dependencies, the appropriate function is uh, use this use package. Uh, I pretty much always run this with minimal version equals true. Uh, you can specify minimal version as an absolute requirement. What minimal version equals true does is it checks the, the version of the package that is currently available to you, most easily seen on leap paths. Uh, and that version is getting written into the, into the description file. Um, so, Oh, uh, yeah, so I think this is, yep. What mean, min minimum version to indicate requires square alpha consideration. So, um, yeah, so when you say mean, when you say min version equals true, well, you would say, well, it's like with deplier verbs, right? It was like mutate add, mutate all, mutate whatever now it's mutate across so if your code uses mutate across you need to declare a proper dependency on deplier uh 1.0 whatever it was used if you just specify use package deplier and it's dropped into description it will break on very old versions that don't have access to deplier mutate across and it's your fault as, as the developer that you did not require the specific version on the other hand uh, it gets annoying if you if you require the most recent version on CRAN. Um, it's it's um, uh, I have setups uh, where I have tightly controlled packages going to specific short range of two two three days on CRAN so that everything is compatible with one another. And I really hate when somebody tries to break that and uh, give me some version from two days ago. And that's just me. Okay. Uh, dependencies. Yep. So um, when you run DevTools, uh, DevTools check, uh, some of the output you're going to see is the missing package dependencies. So that typically means that you've typed library, your interactive version, or you have library deplier or library ggplot to library, whatever. Uh, 
somewhere in your scripts. So that library was loaded. Your code functioned with this stuff in memory, but technically speaking, everything has to be package colon colon function, right? So when you just write filter and mutate without deployer in front of it and without having imported that, uh, it might run when you do your work, when you run your tests, but uh, on a standalone system, it may not work and DevTools check will uncover that. Again, that's going to be the whole chapter 10. Um, so declaring the new version number ensures that the end, end, end users will get the functionality they need, uh, but it adds to the frustration in some of the more tightly controlled environments or in situations where you need to make sure that you have consistent state of your uh, package configurations. Uh, historic ways of declaring dependencies was depends uh, command, depends field in, in description file. Um, basically these days, the only depends you're going to see is dependence on specific R version. Um, and because well, everything else is now either imports or suggests. Um, so linking to is C code and I don't have much to say about this thing. So the conundrums with the R versions is the format of the RDS files uh, using version two, version version three, which is 3.5. Uh, you see some of the, uh, some of the packages, uh, some of those dependencies uh, depends on R at least 3.5. Sometimes it gets added automatically uh, by some of the tools, dev tools. I'm not sure by by whom, but it gets added. Um, so you need to be careful with RDS version support if you have to work with R under 3.5. Uh, one other thing that uh, I added to the slides is that base pipe was introduced in 4.1. And if your code uses the base pipe, you need to require that version of R. Um, that's not in the book, but that's something that might slip between the cracks. Uh, again, most people would probably have higher version of R, but that that needs stuff like this needs to be declared. Uh, some other versions, um, other other fields. So version lazy data uh, is loading uh, for the for lazy loading of the data. We just we've looked into that in chapter seven um where the data are kind of what R does is it kind of scans the namespace of the package uh, and it kind of makes itself aware that there's a, that there's a data set that's uh, sitting somewhere but it's not getting loaded until the user is specifically requesting that data set um and I actually seen different opinions on that uh, as I was looking for material for this chapter, some people think that lazy data is, is a bad idea uh, because it increases the load time for the package um, when this scan has to happen. Um, well, I'm not convinced by that. I think that's, if that's what, what most people use, then it probably makes sense. Um, on the other hand, there are some packages that uh, uh, require specifically loading data so uh, when i was learning r in mid 2000s that was that had to be done a lot now this is less common um collate so collate controls the order in which our files are sourced uh, the only reference when i've seen that needed is when the class system is being used so that um the class operations class uh, methods are applied appropriately uh, by the syntax checkers um, along the way. Well, if you have to rely on collate to reload functions in the appropriate order, that's that's a little weird. That should not be happening. So vignette builder uh, is typically neater, but you can specify something else. There's, uh, for instance, alt doc package that uh, deals with some other 
markdown niche formats, so this with Quarto and so on, uh, needs compilation. So if you only have R code, uh, you can notify CRN and other systems explicitly that they don't have to try to build this using C compilers and don't they don't have to look for C compilers, let's put it this way, because um again in my environment that's controlled by IT, I may not have access to the C compiler, to R tools, uh, and some packages don't get installed because of that, because they so they declare that they need compilation on the on the final ultimate machine because there's C code underlying stuff. So uh, if you only have R code, it may be a good idea to say that it does need compilations. So system requirements, um, that's kind of, well, what else your system, what else your package has that uh, should be on the system uh, my understanding uh, is that it's not getting parsed by any tools uh, in a programmatic way. It's just to, inf to inform the users that this stuff should be there. Um, so, and they still get sort of populated. And you should not be using that. Um, you can write your own fields for, for description. It's but that probably if you have if you find yourself doing that you're probably doing something pretty advanced like meta management of packages or whatever um i don't have particularly good indication as to when that when that's not going to be needed so um as we've seen description is the file that's been actively managed by a lot of development tools. Um, so Dev Tools goes into that. Desk file, Desk Library goes into that. Our Oxygen goes into that. So our Oxygen adds uh, stuff like a list markdown equals true, which I used to remember what it means and but don't remember now. So a version of our Oxygen, um, what it's supposed to support uh, to be supported. Um, so that kind of stuff. Um, so this this is the example of a custom field that the R oxygen package um, added to the description file. Um, so there are ways to standardize this by uh, desk library, uh, and I've also seen fails of DevTools check when something was not properly configured, properly written in description file. Um, like there were no commas between packages in the imports, for instance. Um, that's if you edited this by hand and you didn't put the comma between packages, then that's that's going to produce uh, an error at the check time. Um, and I think that's all of the material that I've had um, to talk about. Let us look at the chat. Not important, but why was declaratively in quotes in ggplot? Probably this means that this is a specific technical terms term that means something to Hedlewickham. It may not mean as much for us, but declarative has probably has the technical meaning. Uh, I need to watch John's talk. I'm surprised by the use of API. A specific idea of what an API is and the definition seems to be much broader. What does it even mean to put API in quotes and descriptions? Anybody have any examples of named API used in a package? Um, well, um, so there is a broad meaning of API as a application programming interface, basically explaining how to interact with your code, right? So. Python people call documentation API, right? So when you look at Pandas data frame, uh, it's it says the API of data frame of Pandas data frame is such and such, uh, and that's those are the uh, methods that are ap applicable to Pandas data frames, and those are the functions that operate on Pandas data frames. So in that regard, the API is a is a this broader terms and when we're talking about versions uh, versions versions uh, 
So in saying when you're making compatible API changes, API is being used in that sense of um, what inputs and outputs are provided by your by your code. What kind of inputs uh, it's taking, what kind of uh, outputs it's producing. If instead of you were returning a list uh, of stuff, but you decided to return a data frame instead, well, that's that's a breaking change. You're supposed to increase your version to uh, include that. In terms of uh, packages that may be using specific APIs, uh, let's say census API or package. That's the one Re I tidy I, census. Tidy census, yeah. Um, mm, well, retrieve data from the census API. Well, here API is not in quotes. You say tidy census. Yeah, that's that's the one I was thinking of. Mm, load your sense boundary as tidyverse and SF ready data frames. So this is this is more appropriate. So Kyle is Kyle is is more responsible programmer um who puts the single quotes as 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 they were needed. Yep. Thanks okay, for so coming through this. Does this answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Jeff trees, package dependence trees. Probably yeah, probably that's the one I was thinking about. Yes, and this is the tidy census. Um, yep, I use that too. Um, well, I go to API census because it, I I often need that stuff that's that's not on on that's not precoded in data census. Right. Tidy, tidy, tidy census has ACS American Community Survey. It has geography, but sometimes I use more obscure stuff like the planning database, population estimates, and that's uh, those are not in the tidy census. Uh, can you go back to the slides on, I think the version slide maybe? Yeah. This, this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, maybe you know this, maybe, maybe someone else knows. Um, are there tools to check your package to tell you to put the a minimum version um, requirement in your package? Like maybe it does see you're using mutate across, then it tells you to put that in there. Mm. Well. I guess the same thing for like minimum version of R, like if you have a pipe. See, this, 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 this is, this is, this is nonsense, right? So okay. this is, this is done poorly, right? Okay, well, so this is dependence on deployer mutate across. Stringer, okay, which version of Stringer? Come on. Which version of Pure? Which version of Erlang? That's, that's. That's not the greatest description file, in my opinion. Um, yeah, yeah, but the updates updates were very recent, so mm -hmm. yeah. So I wouldn't say this is a recipe for disaster, but this is this may cause problems, right? So in in that if this is such a basic version of a SAF that it's uh doesn't really matter and or if there's only one function that uses sf and that's a very basic use of sf then yeah uh but generally i would expect that stuff like this would be uh much more um much more tightly described uh, so thomas lamley is supposed to know what he's doing right I don't know if there's any easy access to, to the code, though. Um, I'm not going to look into TARS. Sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure how to get into that, but I can probably find it. Mm. Yeah, I'm trying to find survey package. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, I don't have it. Just nonsense. Uh, it looks like, yeah, this was from this chapter. Um, they gave the tidyverse um like what they do for versioning um but it says mm -hmm. we don't currently have the tooling to do better like in the book itself yeah, uh, nine point six point one. Um, I have a link there at the end of that. It, there's like a little description of what the tidyverse team does. Um, The de facto policy of the tidyverse team is to specify a minimum version when using a known new feature or when someone encounters a version problem in authentic use. This isn't perfect, but we don't currently have the tooling to do better. It seems to work fairly well in practice. Um, well, so my partial reaction to that is that I, um, I do a lot of package management, historical pa package uh, management with Groundhog, mm. right? So, uh, and basically what you do with Groundhog um, is you say, basically inst instead of install packages, you go with the specific, here's the list of packages that you need and here's the date that you need them from. Uh, and it goes on to figure out what versions existed on that date. So when you make the specific declarations of what dependencies are, uh, it's just a little easier for tools like Groundhog or RN for, for the package manager PM uh, to keep track of what's what's required. So it's it's when when you start building those systems of packages, um uh, uh, when this this becomes a little bit more important relevant that's that's my opinion it's yeah. not a very strong opinion but that's well i'm yeah i'm i don't know what happened here yeah um Yes, desirable for minimum version requirement is genuine. The package would be broken otherwise. Yeah, I, I'll. I'll I don't know. So this, 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 this is this, this is where reasonable people start disagreeing, uh, yeah. probably. Um, Do you think that? Well, I mean, minimums for every package. Hmm? Do you think there should be? You should declare a minimum for every package. If. Well, this is from survey package by Thomas Lamley. Um so he has depends, and he has imports, and he has suggests, and he only has. 
a strong requirement on only one package, uh, which is also the package he wrote. Well, maybe, well, I'm probably wrong then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'm saying that the d description with no specific requirements is is is, is a fairly bad one. Um, but well, again, the biggest problems. Well, my my biggest problems that I have with R is those different different packages. And again, because uh, the resources that I have to access are managed by IT rather than by myself. So it's difficult for me to configure. It's difficult uh, for me to uh, maintain the list of appropriate packages uh, I also work uh, well with a, with a sizable company and if I put something like okay well let's all use this network location to put packages then it quickly becomes a mess because people install packages at different dates and they're not compatible with one another so my big paranoia is this managing versions of the packages so that they are consistent with one another and they they work with one another without breaking so that's 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 my attitude that i bring to this uh that's my opinion that i bring into this view of minimum versioning if people are not scarred by that, that those issues then um it's probably not not a big concern for you yeah to that's totally fair um do uh do we have any other questions or comments um before we wrap up here okay all right um yeah thank thank you stas thank you for the yeah so uh well one other thing is that i've uh, on some occasions i just went to the description files of the existing packages and I did modify those uh, requirements. So instead of saying, well, this this version of the package requires rlang 1.1.0. I say, nah, I don't have 1.1.0. I don't want to install it. I'll clock it back to 1.05 and see if it works. You shouldn't be doing that, but sometimes mm -hmm. it, it does work in those situations where you really don't want to uh, get into the rabbit hole of updating a whole bunch of packages yeah that definitely... uh, that's that's what description <laughs> files are for and say well this is what I, this is what i need and again i i would look into the history of the changes well that's that's what other thing um that would, would be worth mentioning and probably this is somewhere in the life cycle uh that you need to document the changes that you're making um this is news.md file that's automatically converted by package down into proper page. Um, but that's something for others to figure out what the breaking changes were and what the when a particular new function appeared, when a particular function changed function functionality, changed the inputs and outputs. That's um, that's kind of paper trail of, of your changes. That's also, I think, is important. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, and thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that tip as well. That definitely uh, <laughs> makes sense as as a little hack to have. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks again for presenting. We're, we're glad that you're able to present this week. Um, Okay. And awesome. it looks like I think next week I'm going to be presenting. And then uh, I think based on the sign up sheet, it looks like uh, the next few weeks are, are full, but definitely take a look at ahead and uh, sign up if you can. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll see everyone next week. Thank you.